before everything else, I'd like to express my my joy as well as my feeling very honored that the Gomon Kim Pong Foundation and the Bajara Yasan magazine have chosen to have their fourth annual lecture here at Suan Mo. Gomon Kim Tong himself before he died in the forest, came to Suan Mok many times, and we had many talks. And he had very high hopes for the for humanity. And so now, even though he's he has died, he's able to come here under the the name of the foundation, and so we're very delighted that this has happened. <clears throat> the second point is that we have come to meet at this time, meaning before dawn. There are certain reasons for this which we would like you to understand. The early morning like this has a lot of meaning. It is especially, the mind is especially suitable for thinking, discussing, and investigating things clearly. The reason that this time is so appropriate is that the mind is in very good shape, very clear, very open. But by the time of late morning, the teacup begins to get filled. At early in the morning like this, our teacups aren't yet filled. But usually they get filled up by the late morning or early afternoon. And then if we go and mix any alcohol in, then the, the tea starts boiling as it overflows and everything becomes chaotic and con there's a place in the Pali that talks about the mind being gentle, flexible, and ready to work. In the early morning like this, the mind has those qualities of gentleness, flexibility, and readiness. So this is a good time for us to take care of our various duties and to look deeply into Dhamma. Many flowers open in the early morning. In the same way, our minds can open, open and blossom in the early morning. We should consider the fact that the Buddha was awakened in roughly this time, very at the end of a, the night, just before dawn. So we should give proper importance to this, the value of this time. We should be willing to sacrifice our sleep in order to meet like this. Except that there's nowhere in this world that when they have meetings and conferences, they start at this time of day. They, this is unfortunate because a great opportunity is lost because this is the time of day where the tea hasn't begun to fill up the cup yet and there isn't any odors or vapors of alcohol floating around. Now we come to the topic on which we've been invited to speak, Buddhists and, the, and nature conservation. This is something we need to look at. First of all, we must note that there are two kinds of Buddhists. The first kind of Buddhist is someone who knows the Buddha and has benefited from this knowing of the Buddha. The second kind of Buddhist is one who's just a Buddhist 
by birth or by name. It's what's written on their birth certificate or whatever when they're born. So we must notice that there are two kinds of Buddhists. And, of course, it's the first kind of Buddhist that is the, the true Buddhist. Only the real Buddhist will be able to conserve or protect nature. The second kind of Buddhist probably won't be able to do so. The genuine Buddhist can conserve nature even on the deepest level. The level, the mental level, or the, the preservation of a deep mental nature. The, the Buddhist merely by name is not able to protect or preserve nature at all, not even merely physical aspects or material aspects of nature. When the mental nature has been preserved, then the external physical nature can preserve itself. When we talk about nature, this inner mental nature, we ought to use a, a different word, the word dhamma datu the natural essence of, of Dhamma. So when we talk about this inner nature, we, we mean a fundamental essence or element of Dhamma. When this can be protected within, when this is preserved, then the, the external nature is able to preserve itself. When we can preserve this inner nature, this dhammadhatu, then there's nothing that will cause selfishness. There's no egoism arising. There's no sense of self causing ego and selfishness. When there's no selfishness, then there's nothing that's going to go out and destroy the external nature. And when nothing is destroying it, this physical nature is quite able to protect itself. To merely be worried about preserving the physical nature is not quite up to the, the status or, or honor of a Buddhist. We ask all Buddhists to be most concerned with preserving this inner nature or dhammadhatu. This is what is truly appropriate to the, to the Buddhists. Next, we should examine the word anurak, or conserve, preserve. There are two kinds of preservation or conservation. The first is kind of like walking in one's sleep, or where one is getting all excited and and herds are flocking this way and that way. This kind of conservation is, is not correct. It's important that our conservation efforts are correct. And this brings up the question, what kind of power or authority we're going to use in, in having some, our conservation or preservation? when we, we ourselves don't have any, any power. 
the kind of power which forces people to directly forces people to do something is one kind of authority. But then the power of discussing things and talking in order to develop a proper understanding of, of issues. This is un until people are quite willing to do their, take care of their responsibilities voluntarily. There are these two kinds of power. We should be very clear about the difference. In one of the pillar edicts of King Asoka of India, it, one can read that he, he forced certain families to plant various kinds of tree. This family would plant one kind of tree. This plant family would plant jackfruit. Another family would plant some other trees. And so they were forced to plant various kinds of trees. And the end result was that there were many people who were planting and taking care of various kinds of fruit trees and ornamental kinds of trees. When I went to India, I was very surprised to see that there were so many mango trees. There seemed to be more mango trees than any other kind of trees. And so I thought that, oh, this must have been the, the result of King Asoka's work, that there are so many mango trees, because mangoes were one of the trees listed in the, the pillar edict. Also in the Pali scriptures, we can find very many references to, to various kinds of parts, which it seems just about all the royalty, as well as the wealthiest citizens, each had their own park or preserve or bit of forest where they, that they were responsible for, in which they could make use of. This is a different example of of preservation. In this one, there was no one forcing them to do it, but it arose from a certain kind of thinking which was correct. And then this, the authority or power just came from this correct thinking. And the result was many, many parts. India would seem to be full of these, these parts. And the, the monks at that time, the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, were able to make, were stayed in these a lot of the time. And the various millionaires and royalty would sometimes buy them from each other in order to offer to the sangha. And in fact, the Buddha passed away in one of these parks owned by certain, certain royalty. So one asks, what was the motive or motivation for these, these parks? It seems that there was, that people were preserving the inner nature, the dhammadhatu, that natural essence of, of, na of Dhamma. And because this was preserved, there was no selfishness. And all these parks could arise and be maintained because of the lack of selfishness that these parks continued was because there wasn't enough selfishness to go around and destroy them. So, because of preserving this inner Dhammadhatu, these parts were possible. When Buddhists reflect that the Buddha was born under trees, the Buddha awakened while sitting under a tree, 
the Buddha taught outdoors, sitting among trees. And in the end, the Buddha passed away between, beneath some trees. When Buddhists reflect like this, it's impossible not to love trees and not to want to, to preserve them. In this way, by maintaining a correct inner nature, it is, it's natural to preserve the outer nature. So for Buddhists, we must preserve this inner dhammadhatu, and then it won't be very difficult to preserve the external physical nature. Now we should consider this thing we call nature. We can see at a minimum two aspects of nature. First is the inner nature, the nature which in within, which is the mind. And then the external nature of various phenomena arising in the world around us. We need to understand these two kinds of nature, especially to see which of the which aspect of nature is has power over the other. Which which aspect of nature can control the other? If we understand this properly, then we'll be able to manage things so that all of nature is is taken care of properly. This inner nature the Buddha specifically called the Dhamma Datu. Datu means element or it can mean a an essence, especially a naturally existing essence. So this inner Dhamma Datu is how the Buddha referred to to it. Sometimes he just called it the Datu. And then he specified that this Dhamma Datu is Itapajayada. Itapajayada is the fundamental fact. Well, excuse me. And this Datu is the, the source or basis for Dhamma for all of nature. He specified that this Dhamma Datu is Itapajayada the law that all things occur and happen according to causes and conditions. This conditionality of things is called itapajayata, itapajayata. And the Buddha said that himself that whether a Buddha, whether Buddhas arise in the world or not, this Dhammadhatu exists. This basic fact exists independent of whether there are Buddhas and Buddhas around or not. If we can preserve this the tapajayata, this law of nature within ourselves, then it will be impossible for selfishness or egoism to arise. And when there's no ego and selfishness, there's nothing to destroy nature. There's nothing to exploit and abuse nature. And then nature, the external physical nature, is completely able to preserve itself automatically. So please be very interested in this inner nature of itapajayata, the law of conditionality. When we can preserve, or when there is no selfishness, then we can preserve the purity and great beauty of nature. If there is no more selfishness in this world, then nature will be able to flower in its natural purity and beauty in a, to a tremendous degree. 
except that selfishness has already appeared in the world and it's been going on for a long time and so humanity has been exploiting and destroying nature for a long while. Even in the, the earliest scriptures, 2000, speaking of a time 2,500 years ago, there's an incident recorded where somebody came across a tree that was full of ripe fruit, but they weren't able to climb the tree and pr pick the fruit. So they went and got an axe and chopped down the tree. And then they took away as much fruit as they could carry. But of course they couldn't carry it all away and most of it just stayed and rotted. And so this kind of selfishness isn't anything new. This kind of destruction and selfishness has been going on for a long time. And this kind of thing happens even here. About 50 years ago when I was, before we started Suen Mok, I was looking for a place to, to move Suen Mok. And not too far behind where we are now, I came across a sada tree, which is a big legume tree with, with pods, with big seeds, which are very popular. In, especially in southern Thailand. And I came across a big, a full-grown sada tree that had been cut down. So when I asked about this, it seems somebody had cut it down just to take away one load of these, these big, long pods, which is maybe 10% or even less of what a full Siddha tree has. So this kind of selfishness is, is not unknown around here. So please understand that if we protect the inner nature, then the outer nature will be taken care of by itself. If there is an and a mental correctness, then physical things will be correct by themselves, naturally. And then the correct, the outer, the outer correctness, when there's things are physically correct, there's a, a beneficial side effect for the mind, we should be very aware of this also. But if, if the external nature is in error, if it's incorrect, then this will have very negative side effects, very negative influence on the inner nature. And if both of these are in error, if both are going wrong, then it will lead to very dangerous consequences and there will be death and destruction all around. This is the reason that Buddhists work to preserve the inner nature, this Dhammadhatu, which we have, we have discussed. For the Buddhists, it's necessary to preserve the source to preserve this inner state of correctness, this natural correctness within. When this source is preserved, then the results are taken care of automatically. The Buddhist doesn't blindly try and change the results. The Buddhist knows that we must deal with the causes and sources of things. I'd like to take a little time to study India as an example or a lesson. If we read the Pali text, it's very apparent that back then India was covered with forests, that there was 
forests everywhere. The rivers were full of water, ran very deep. The trees were very tall. This description is very is scattered throughout the Pali scriptures. But when I went to India a few de- few decades ago, about 30 years ago, most of the trees were gone. India was no longer covered with forest, it's covered with fields and pastures. And the Neranja, Neranja River, which is supposed, used to be so deep that people believed that there was a, a Naga at the bottom of it. Now, or when I was there, it was just a desert of sand, so that this formerly deep river, now people can just walk right across. So this is, this great change has taken place in India. Now in India there just remains two mountain ranges, the Himalayas in the north and the, and the Wintaya in the, in the south. In the past, it was, the whole country was covered with forests, but now you can just find them in these, these mountains. So India was once covered with forests, but now it's covered with, it's, with problems because the, there's no more forest left, it's just all fields and, and pastures. And so all kinds of problems now have followed with the destruction of the forest. There's all kinds of problems with flooding. In many areas it gets so hot that people die from the heat. There are all kinds of diseases arising from the heat. And other problems, um, not enough water for agriculture, and many problems arising because of the destruction of the forest. So this is the kind of example India gives us. At one time it was one way, but now it's a country full of all kinds of problems. If you want to study any kinds of problems, you can you can find them all in India. And this is resulting from the, the tremendous destruction of the natural environment. And so selfishness, whether intentional or unintentional, whether aware or unaware, this selfishness has changed India from a forest to a field. And although India is a country that's full of all kinds of religious sects, there have been all kinds of schools of religion in India, including Buddhism. But nonetheless, this did not protect the forest because people, people decided that they wanted to eat rice more than eating fruit. Since they didn't want to eat the fruit from the forest, they, they killed the trees in order to plant rice. Now we can look at Thailand. If we compare Thailand with India, there's relatively a lot more forest. There are many more trees remaining. But now it's it's, we're more and more unable to protect the forest. The trees and everything that remains are disappearing quickly <clears throat> to the degree that now in parts of Thailand there is actually drought and the people are very hungry. There's a place in the northeast called the, the, the Plain of Tears or of sor- Sorrow and Tears because the people don't, the rain doesn't fall and there's nothing to eat. People have been trying, various NGOs and groups have been trying very hard to change it into a plane of smiles 
but no matter how much they try, it, it hasn't worked. They haven't been successful yet. But as long as this kind of selfishness continues, there's no way that a field of tears will change into a field of smiles or a plane of smiles. I, I dare to, to speak in such a direct way. When people, when thought is still selfish, when actions remain selfish, when people remain selfish people, how in blazes are we going to change a, a field of, of tears into a field of smiles? It will be impossible. Don't go putting the blame on population increase. This increase of the population is going to happen anyway. The real blame is on the increase of selfishness. Selfishness has been growing far more rapidly than the population. And the destruction is arising from this rapid growth in selfishness. As long as we are slaves of the economy, as long as we are slaves of material industry, then it's just, a, it's going to be very, very difficult, if not impossible, to, to have green forests. As long as we're slave to this economy and industry, then selfishness will be dominant, and it's going to be very hard to have any forests remaining. Even right here at Suan Mok, over in this area, next to Suan Mok, coming down out of the hills were some very deep gullies and stream beds where lots of water used to flow. And then on the other, just on the edge of Suan Mok, and by the way, the official name of this monastery is, is Flowing Water Stream. This stream of flowing water is on the other side of the monastery. And up on the cliffs behind the monastery, one can see the remains the, of an old waterfall. But now, if you go to the waterfall where there used to be lots of water, you can't even find one drop to put in your eye. And this, the stream has been dried up for quite a few years. So the water situation even here has, there used to be water all around, but now we've had to drill wells to, to find water. This is because all around the forest has been cut down. The natural forest has been destroyed. When I first came to Suan Mok 50 years ago, the stream on the south side of Suan Mok was so deep that an elephant could walk through and it would cover the elephant's back. Now if you go there, unless you know where it is, you won't even find it. There's a few places where there are some puddles that collect a few times of the year. But in most places, the stream is totally dried up. This is because of the economy has come in. The economy has come to Suan Mok and destroyed the forest, dried up the water. So when the economic age, the economic era came in and destroyed things, when we talk about the economic era, we mean the era of, of plantation rubber. When the, the rubber industry came up from Penang, up to the south, until the people here knew about planting rubber. Then they, they went and cut down all the original forests. This whole area used to be forest all around here. And now they've cut it all down and planted their, their rubber trees. No matter how much we ask people not to, to leave the forest, to, 
to watch out for the forest. They wouldn't listen because, of course, there are very strong voices telling them to cut down the trees and plant rubber. This is the economic progress that has destroyed the forests in this area. So if you look around, it's like there's just a wave of, of rubber leaves, especially from above. If you go on the mountain, you just see these rubber leaves bouncing in the wind. There's, you know, it's just this monotonous sea of rubber trees all over the place. No matter how many rubber trees you plant, a forest of rubber trees is never going to replace a real forest or a natural forest. The rubber trees, no matter how big they get, can never maintain the, the water in the soil. These trees, rubber can never, can never form a proper watershed. And so that this, the original natural forest has been replaced with a forest of rubber trees. Then all the water has dried up. The streams around Suanmok have dried up. The wells in the village, <coughs> the villagers near here, they don't have any water to use during certain parts of the year. Even all the way into the market in Chaya, the water level in the wells has gone down and down and down. Even kilometers away, which of course people never thought of, the people in the market who own a lot of the land up here don't have their water in their wells has gone down because all the forest has been destroyed up upstream here. And so people cut down the forest and then there's no no water to use. So in summary, our natural forest was destroyed at the time that the, the rubber economy came in. And then because of the worship of the economy, our forest was destroyed. Next, we can look at what the future is going to be like, what's going to happen later. The forests have been destroyed, the water the water tables in the ground have gone lower and lower. How is it going to be possible to have peace in these conditions? Although India may have cut down all its forests, India still has the Himalayas, which are huge, and they store up incredible amounts of water and then release this during the various seasons. But in Thailand, we, we don't have any Himalayas. There's no big mountains to, to bank our hopes on. And so what is Thailand going to do when all the forests are gone? So it's better that we focus our attention on nature, do our best to, to understand nature. Once again, when we, when we look at nature, we can see at least two different levels. There's the very deep, profound, fundamental level with, within this nature of the Dhammadhatu, which is so deep that you, you can't see it. And then there's the external nature of the various phenomena that we can see and touch in this world around us. So there are these two natures. We need to understand them both properly, and we need to know the difference between them. We've got a problem in that we've been using the word tamachat or dhamma jati. Dhamma, you know, jati means birth. And the English word nature doesn't quite translate all of the meaning of this. So we ask that you use the word Dhamma Jati instead of the English word nature because this English word doesn't get the whole meaning. The word Dhamma Jati 
has at least four fundamental aspects. The first is Dhammajati nature, all the things of nature itself. Then second is the law of all these things which are born, which exist. This law of all this Dhammajati, all this nature. Then there is the duty that naturally arises from this law of nature, the, the law of Dhamma. And then there is the result that comes when that duty is done. When the duty is done according to the law of nature, there is a, a certain result. So these are the four aspects of Dhamma Jati. Nature itself, the law of nature, the duty arising or inherent in the law of nature, and the result that comes from doing that duty. When we talk about Dhamma Jati, we mean things that are born out of the natural order of things. There is an order, there is Dhamma, and everything arising out of Dhamma, everything born from Dhamma. This is what we call Dhamma Jati. Things which are ordinarily born, which are just arising or being created out of the way things are. There is the, the way of this world, the way things are. And everything arising out of this, born of this, is what we call Dhamma Jati. Whether this is the same as the English word nature, we're not sure, although the word nature comes from the Latin word for birth, so there may be some similarity. But there's this, there's nature, the body of nature, there's the body of the substance of all these things that arise out of the natural order or the, the way the universe is then there's the law of that, the, the order of everything. Then there's the duty regarding that law and the results that come from doing that duty. These are the aspects of, of Dhamma Jati. In take ourselves as human beings and take our, our own bodies in these bodies we've got we've got nature itself there are these physical bodies and then within these bodies of ours and all their organs and systems there is a law there's the basic dhamma law of of all this body of ours and always from moment to moment there's the duty of taking care of all this the duty of survival and of continuing life and then arising from that duty are the various results, sometimes happiness, sometimes pain, sometimes pleasant results, sometimes unpleasant. So even within ourselves, within just our physical bodies, we have all four meanings of Dhamma Jati. In one human being, we can find all four aspects of of nature, of, of the things that are born from Dhamma. In the world, the entire world, we can find all four meanings of Dhamma Jati. And in the universe, all the world together, we can see all four of these meanings of nature. Please give great attention to these four meanings of nature. Because if we don't understand nature thoroughly, if we don't understand all four of these, we won't be able to preserve this nature. And if we're not able to preserve these four aspects of nature within ourselves, you're just wasting your time if you think you're going to preserve the nature out there. It's, it will be impossible. So please do your best to deeply, thoroughly understand these four 
four natures or dhamma jati. The Buddhists strive to penetrate to this inner nature, this this mental or spiritual nature that is with in all of us. Specifically, the Buddhist tries to realize the the Dhamma Datu that is inherent within all of us, within all of all of nature. And then by preserving this Dhamma Datu, which is nothing but the law of of nature, the law of Itapajayada, the fact that all things depend on conditions. All things are interdependent and interrelated. The law of it's also called the law of Paticca Samupada, of dependent origination, that all the things that arise and exist in this world do so, dependent on other things, on other conditions. <clears throat> this fundamental law of nature is what the Buddhists strive to realize. Because if this law of Itapajayada is clear in our hearts, if we experience this clearly, then it's absolutely impossible for any ego and selfishness to arise. And then there won't be any destruction of the physical environment, of the nature outside of ourselves. But now there's nobody in this world. Nobody in this world has any interest in the law of nature. Nobody thinks about it, nobody pays attention to it, nobody's aware of it. And so our result is we have lots of material progress. Material progress presents a very ripe opportunity for selfishness. All this material development and change in progress that people are so proud of just makes more and bigger and faster opportunities for selfishness. So be very careful about this, this material progress, this civilization that people have made, because it just supports and sustains more and more selfishness. And when there's this selfishness, there's going to be lots of destruction with it. When there's no respect, when nobody honors and worships the, the natural law of Itapajayada, then the devas, the deities, the celestial beings are selfish. The kings and royalty are selfish. The monks are selfish. All the religious officials are selfish. And the, all the other members of society are selfish. And then society is just chock full of selfishness when there is no respect for, no honoring of this law of all nature, the natural law. And so the capitalists, the owners are selfish. The workers, the laborers are selfish. The people who are neither capitalists nor workers, they're selfish too. And so this world of ours is full of selfishness. There isn't left just one person. There's not one person sitting here who, who isn't selfish. The rich, the wealthy are selfish. The poor are selfish. The middle class is selfish. So this is the world that we've made for ourselves. And so when people are selfish, these selfish people go out and destroy nature. They destroy the environment. And when they go and destroy all of nature, they create in its place things that are very dangerous and harmful. And so now look what we have. Because of all this selfishness, we've destroyed nature. And in its place, we have a world full of pollution. We have to live now in a world that's full of all these poisons and dangerous substances. It's a world full of crime. 
that's coming from all this selfishness. We've got more insanity, craziness, psychosis in this world, so that the governments have to keep building mental hospitals. And even then, these hospitals are never enough to hold all the mental cases, all the crazy people. So this is what we've created with our selfishness. It's very sad, very shameful, very pitiful that, that animals, ordinary animals like the chickens we raise here, haven't, haven't increased in selfishness for, thousands, for thousands, millions of years. For who knows how long, they're the same, they're as selfish as they ever were, and it doesn't grow. But look at, but it's so pitiful and sad and shameful that with human beings, and we, you know, we come from pretty much the same beginning, and whereas the animals are as selfish, are no more selfish than they were in the beginning, human beings are getting more and more selfish as time goes on. And now we live in an era where the results of this are becoming very painfully obvious. So where animals are just, have not gotten any more selfish, human beings have grown, increased, developed, progressed in selfishness. We don't know how many times, tenfold, a hundredfold, a thousandfold, and it, it doesn't seem to have any end in sight. When there's this selfishness, then there is all this destruction going on. Take, for example, the, we have to think about the, the United Nations. The United Nations was formed out of supposedly very beautiful human ideals to, to bring peace. But look at the UN itself. They, not only are they totally unable to bring peace to the world or to to end selfishness, even in the UN, they can't get people to sit down and really agree on anything. To just, to really sit together and discuss things and really understand, they can't even do this. And even in the UN, you can sometimes find some selfishness. So, unfortunately, the UN, which a group for which we had great hope, is unable to counteract selfishness. So the UN has become a, a place of argument. It's a boxing ring for, for human, for various selfish people. And so we invite everyone to get rid of the UN, get rid of, you know, the United Nations Organization, scrap it, and in its place, build Euro, Euro instead of UNO, the United Religions Organization. If you think I'm crazy, you're, you're free to think whatever you want. You can call me crazy or whatever. But to, to, to create Euro, a true organization of United Religions, this has great potential to, to limit and end selfishness. If the religions, real religions, true religions people can come together and really understand each other and then work together, then we can all in our own ways overcome selfishness. So from our perspective, Euro, has potential to get to the, the root cause of all our problems, which is selfishness. This is something of which you know is utterly incapable of doing. They don't even have the perspective to even see the problem. If you want, you can just scrap the United Nations, or if you want, you can keep both, both 
United Religious Organizations and the United Nations Organizations. We might need the UN still to deal with kind of political matters. But if we keep the UN, it must be under the selfishness. For Thailand especially, we need to have a ministry of religion. And the ministry of religion should control, should supervise and regulate all the other ministries. If we can have a, a government where all the ministries are being supervised by the Ministry of Religion, there's a chance that we could have some decent government. But it would be very difficult to find a minister for this, to run this ministry. If we, once we have a Ministry of Religions which lives up to its name, then we won't have to worry at all about preserving or conserving nature. If we had a real ministry of religions, then both the inner natures and the outer natures would be fine. Things would be taken care of. And so we need to, to place our hopes in, in religion. This is the only legitimate source that is going to be able to help us to solve the, the basic underlying causes of these problems. So then the answer to the question is quite short. How are we going to conserve or preserve nature? The answer is just when all Buddhists are, are actually correct Buddhists. When the Buddhists are really Buddhists, then nature will be preserved and conserved automatically. There won't be any of these problems. Nature in all its meanings, all its aspects on all levels will be preserved when Buddhists are finally really Buddhists. All religions aim to teach the ending of selfishness. All religions stress ending selfishness. So let's get the religions involved. If we can get the religions involved in these situations, we'll be able to, to end these problems. If the religions have a role in things, a proper role where they're doing their work of ending selfishness, then the other things will be able to work themselves out. Even in the, the Old Testament of the Christian Bible, there's a real gem of old Jewish wisdom where it says, don't, where God, God himself, the first thing he said to humanity was, the very first thing was, don't eat the fruit from the tree that leads to knowing good and evil, or you'll die. So from the very beginning, God has taught humanity not to get caught up in good and evil, meaning to once we eat that fruit, we become slaves to positiveness and negativeness. And this is the source of all selfishness. So even, even in the, the Bible, this is made very clear. So may we all live above the influence and power of positive and negativeness. Then there will be no selfishness. But now we worship the positive. We're, we're great honorers of positiveness. And because we're so... So we've turned positiveness into a god. And this means that we have selfishness as our god. And when we, we are slaves to the god of selfishness, then there's just no way that we can hope for peace. So stop being slaves to positive and negative, negativeness, and then we'll be free. When we're free, we're free of selfishness. 
and then we'll be able to preserve the correctness, the naturalness of all aspects and all levels of nature. So please free yourself from positiveness and negativeness. When you liberate yourselves from this positiveness and negativeness, and then you'll no longer be a slave of selfishness. <coughs> when all of us are free, when there's no more selfishness, then we, all the problems will end. We won't have to worry about any of these problems anymore. And then the world will be fresh, beautiful, and alive henceforth. So the last thing we have to say is a very special and strong request that you all live your lives free of the power of positiveness and negativeness. Please live above this power of positiveness and negativeness so that you can be free of all selfishness so that all these problems can disappear. And finally, thank you all for, for listening. You've had a lot of endurance. We ask your forgiveness for forcing you to suffer, to endure such difficulties. But we hope that through doing this, that the wishes, the, the aspirations that we have expressed can find some fruition and success. So may, may we all be able to bring this to, com to successful completion. So thank you for being very good listeners that this is the end of our, our meeting this morning. Thank you.